Hello and welcome to a bonus video, an audio thing from MinMax. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Imran Khan. Howdy. Imran Khan, co-host of Kinda Funny. Uh, yes, that is my current part-time thing. <laughs> it's very exciting. So if you're watching the video version of this, you see that uh, Imran, uh, you either got uh, the fanciest lens in the world or you're using some sort of digital thing to blur out your entire house behind you. Skype lets me just like blur the background. So I was like, oh, I don't have to clean. That's good. <laughs> It's, you can tell it's just heaps of uh, McDonald's wrappers and stuff behind them. But the point is, if you'd like to listen to this conversation instead of watching it on YouTube, you can become a supporter of MinMax. And if you're a $5 supporter, you get access to a feed that's filled with a lot of exclusive audio and fun stuff like that. So like our Deepest Dives, Game Club, stuff like that, the audio version will always be in that feed. So that option is there for you. But Imran Khan, it's good to hear your voice again, sir. It's good. To, this is It's weird for me because like when we were doing this at Game Informer with this like Skype call... We were always positioned in such a way that my camera couldn't see anybody. Yeah. So now I'm looking right at you. It's like, oh, this is the actual conversation where I can talk to someone directly. Yeah, normally you just had to pretend and, like, move your head around. Look, I'm proud of the Game Informer studio, but that was always a weakness. <laughs> like, well, we could rig up a camera so you can kind of see it, but it was always, like, slapdash. Like, we need him on right now. Let's go. Let's just get him any way we can. <laughs> yeah, I take it kind of funny. He's a little bit fancier than uh, the Game Informer studio. And it's it's a cool thing to be able to like to sit down, like have a set of cameras and like people actually like adjusting things right there. Like it's it's a different feel. So, so different, not better yes. or worse, just different. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was just thinking the other day about like, well, the MinMax studio, how do we get around the live stream issue where it's like the guys will be streaming something from the table, but then I just have to run around to the control room myself. It's like <laughs> if we could clone Leo and get him in here just to help with the starting and stopping of streams, I feel like it would really help. It's a mess. I mean, is that, a, is that not a tier, like Clone Leo? You know what? We haven't tried putting it on there, but honestly, that's a good goal. And I, I want to talk. Would hit it. Oh yeah, uh, you have been uh, secretly very influential. I feel like for the origins of MinMax, like the earliest days, right after the layoffs, I feel like you were one of the first people that I called to talk through some different options. Yeah, I think like the like the Saturday after all the layoffs happened, like you gave me a call that morning. It's like, hey, do you just want to talk about like? this stuff and what the next options were because i mean not to speak for you but it kind of felt like everyone well not everyone but a lot of people had one foot out the door at that point everyone who survived the layoffs well it was a really tough time it was just so yeah. uncertain it seems like now it's stabilized a bit more which i'm right. very happy for everybody at game reformer but i was definitely in the camp of eh, f this <laughs> yeah that weekend was a little weird because like the, the phone calls i did get were a lot of people like this isn't how game informer is supposed to do it it was like yeah like this is it was a very strange thing. And at that time, I I had just said yes to the kind of funny part-time gig. Yeah. And we were trying to figure out, like, okay, but what's what's the long-term solution? And you were – yeah, at the time, you were talking about Patreon a little bit. Yeah, and, like, the debate was whether go for something bigger, like make a full site maybe with writers right. and then, like, partly funded by Patreon. And actually, it was, like – uh, you were helpful on that path. And then I think it was like Leo who's like, just do the thing that you're excited about, which is like the video thing. I was like, oh, that's right. Okay, this could be, I don't have to think and worry about creating like a whole new site where it's like, it's just mainly a YouTube channel and a Patreon. Like, I got that. I don't have to freak out about that. Right. And like there was a period where like investors approached us, like what if we just had a Game Informer 2 with like the people who were laid off? And that was a thing we batted around for a while. And I remember there was a question you asked me on the phone. It's like, if we did a new site, what would you want to do on it? And I had this like very existential moment of, would I want to do the same thing? Would I right. want to? I don't know anything about running a website, but I've got to supposedly learn at some point. Yeah, and, and, and I'm it curious was, now. It was a difficult moment. For sure. And with you like now. Figuring that stuff out. Absolutely. And you have done so much video and podcast content at, at Kind of Funny. Obviously, it was very generous of Greg Miller and the team to, to fly you out and then also JV and Serial yeah. uh, in the early days to be on podcasting and those super fun. But I'm curious now with all this video experience, would you have a different answer? Are you now hooked on like the video aspect of things more so than just uh, cranking out a million news stories? I, yes and no, because like there's a lot of things about the time – when I was at Game Informer, like I got hired as an editor for news, so I was head of a department, which yeah. is an insane thing that I don't know why anyone did. But like I came in there and it's like, okay, here's your job. Your job is to generate content. Your job is to constantly like post news, and I love doing that. It was so much fun, and it was a job that was literally different every single day. And I wouldn't trade that stuff for the world. Mm -hmm. But 
honestly, by the time we were laid off from Game Informer, I was already thinking like, okay, I kind of want to move on to the next stage of whatever this is. And like whether that was at Game Informer or not, that was still a question I was figuring out. But like, for example, at Game Informer, because my job was to generate content for so so much, like to the tune of like 10 stories a day, which is a lot of stuff to do in a single workday. Right. I don't have time for anything else. There were there are so many ideas that were just sitting on the back burner of like, okay, well, I want to do this kind of column. I want to gather clips from Twitter of like funny gaming things. I want to, you know, write more opinion pieces. And as I like, like thinking about that, of like, what are we going to do with this new website? What are we going to do in the coming year? Like, it would just, you don't have time because news ke- keeps happening. And it's a question of, do I want to do this or do I write up what could be a more important story? Right. So like, I was already thinking by the time I, by those layoffs like okay well i want to move on to the next phase it's very cool that i get to do all this cool video stuff but i also don't necessarily think that's where my talents lie oh interesting so like i've been looking at i've been freelancing some pieces recently i forgot how much i just love writing i love writing about video games love analyzing video games and talking on video is so much fun it's like i want to also do that too but it's not it's not my main passion like i the ideal job I would have had was Game Informer in the office three years ago. <laughs> okay, yeah, if you can build that time machine. Yeah, because if people aren't familiar, yeah, you were out in San Francisco working from your home. You had the remote position, which stressed me out because it's like <laughs> I would be so bummed out being disconnected from that office, and especially like, you know, during the layoffs. I felt especially bad for you. Like, oh, just out on your own. That's insane. Uh, although I guess everyone was kind of scattered to the wind that day, which was very confusing. But <laughs> that didn't stress you out too much. You never felt like, oh, I bet there's a lot of fun stuff going on in the office and I'm not part of it. It ebbed and flowed. Like there were times where, because like right after, or not right after I got hired, but soon after I got hired was we had the Game of the Year meetings. And I wasn't really part of those because like I was off on my own thing. Then we had the top 300, which is right after that. Right. It's like, okay, well, these meetings are going on. That's where everyone else is right now. I'm just kind of sitting here writing my news and things like that. But it was also fun when everybody would come into town and we'd like do E3, we'd do GDC, stuff like that. And like it was not, it was good to have that base of people. It was also good to like basically work across my own schedule, work for my own means. Because like I said, I was on an island, but also kind of head of my own department. So yeah. I was just kind of doing whatever I thought was best for certain things. So it was good to be able to like be in my own mental place with that thing to like not have to worry about what are the expectations on me. It was, what do I think will be good? And I get to cho- pick and choose news and write about what I wanted to write about. And that, that kind of environment was good for me in that respect. For sure. And I think a certain amount, you could look at news as like, you know, Andy McNair would have the phrase shoveling coal. There needs to be a certain amount of just like content on the site. Right. But I love that even though you loved all these little stories and writing it, like the legacy for you, I think is just, the amount of news and making people realize that like, oh, gameforward.com slash news, that's, that's a good landing page. You do a good job of kind of like sifting through the chaos of the internet. Right. And there was a, t- there was a time like right before and right after the layoffs where people were like, oh, you like Game Informer is an actual news site now. Yeah. Like you, that changed over the last couple of years. And that was what I was extremely proud of. Like that was what I ended up the mark I ended up leaving there was we went from a thing editors did in their spare time. Like, okay, does anyone have time to write this news up to this is a dedicated thing. This is going to be a news website as well. And I was like, okay, great. Oh, you're actually going somewhere with this now. Right. And like, I, I, I'm actually really impressed by what everyone's been able to do since then. But oh, it's sure. obviously been a lot harder to get news up on the website. On a, on a regular basis, for sure. But it's, it's wild. I yeah. think you had a tweet at some point after the layoffs, but before I left, where you said something along the lines of like just how difficult it was to like look at the news at Game Informer continue on without you. Yeah. What do you want to give a little more insight into what you were thinking when you wrote that tweet? Because like, I mean, I think there was a thing like the day of the layoffs, there was a story about Yakuza, like Yakuza Seven or something got announced, and I was like, that's usually what I would write because I'd wake up in the morning and I'd look at the news, I'd like go like, okay, this is what I want to write about. Let's I'll pin this for later. And it's like. I have thoughts about this. I want to write like, <laughs> this is what this game is doing differently. This is what like, this is what they're announcing and all that stuff. And it's, it was so difficult to be like, where does the, where do these thoughts go now? Do they go to social media? Right. They're not in an official place. Like if I make those thoughts, they're not the official position of Imran Khan news editor. They're mm-hmm. just the thoughts that I have. And they're 
a dime a dozen social media. So it felt, it felt like I was losing not only a status, but also something I'd built up uh, over the years of this is what, like, this is the voice news had on Game Informer. And yes. now the voice is different from mine. Yes, it's a to borrow an analogy and a twist away from Ryan Johnson, the director. It's like you're losing your mech. You were you built up this giant mech and you're storming around, and then it's like, oh, now you're ejecting in Metal Warrior style from Super Nintendo, and now you're just the pilot. And it's like you can still shoot the pistol, but you miss the mech. Yeah, it's Titanfall too. It is. Sure. You know, that's maybe a more timely reference is Titanfall too. Yeah, you're totally <laughs> right. Well, I seeing that tweet really freaked me out because like knowing that I was leaving. It really freaked me out just in terms of like, oh, missing all the people is going to be huge. And then on a weird superficial level, I was just like, oh, I won't know what Game Informer's YouTube password is. And like starting up that YouTube channel from zero, like that's going to be bizarre to not check those views and check those analytics every single day and every comment like that. That was a strange emotional thing to realize that I was leaving behind. That was actually one of the things I was kind of happy about was that. You, when you're working there, you kind of have to be plugged into what the comments are. Sure. And after a certain, like when that happened, I was like, I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to read like, and granted, there's a lot of positivity there, but yeah. there's also just a lot of like the people who comment are commenting because they have something to say. And not all, that's not always a good thing. Well, especially because news stories, it's just, you're going to pull in people with strong opinions from everything. Whereas like mainly the comments I would see would be like, you know, we're doing a replay of Bushido Blade. And it's like, I love Bushido Blade. So, like, <laughs> I never got too stressed out. But when you're writing about more sensitive topics in the game industry and people have very strong opinions and can be crappy, I totally get it. Right. And that's that is something I'm dealing with nowadays, especially, like, at a personality site, like, kind of funny. When you're coming in late and you're coming in after, like, there have been controversial figures that have been all that site. And, like, if your people see you as a replacement to them, especially when you exist somewhat antithetically to them, huh. like, it's people have very strong opinions about it and learning how to filter that sort of stuff out is not something I've ever been good at. Does it feel like moving over to kind of funny and helping out with so many shows? Does it feel like just a, a fire hose of community feedback? It does, especially when you're like, because everyone there is so welcoming and so warm and so happy. Like the producer Kevin Coelho like threw his arm around me at the New Year's party. Is like, thank God you came because you saved up a, <laughs> you saved a lot of what we were doing here. We didn't know what we were gonna do. Like it helped out and like that's heartwarming. But then you go onto like the subreddit sometimes, and yeah. there are so many people who are very nice and very positive, and there are people whose accounts just exist to hate you. Uh huh. And it's like okay, I I'm used to this, but it's not like it hurts less over time. It's just like okay, I know. I know what this is, so I'm getting better at compartmentalizing it. Right, right. That's a scary notion because I think the MinMax community is so sweet right now and that Discord is just like uh, a big digital hug every day. Uh, and I worry about like, oh, if MinMax continues to do well and we see more success, the only direction this can go is bringing in more people, which will naturally bring in a percentage of uh, S-heads, as some would say, right? right. It's just like, it's, it's, it's going to, the purity is going to be diluted based on the success and it's tough to disconnect that but i think like you know greg miller and the team i think they've put, done a good job of trying to harness that community for the positivity right and it seems like that's all i really see is like a very sweet community but it's sad to know that yeah when you get to an audience that huge there's going to be some crap heads uh let in there like i remember specifically we had a gi meeting like i want to say maybe six months when i was there and like the, i remember jv coming up and saying hey we should talk about the fact that there's a part, part of the community that only or it seems to only exist to hate Elise and hate Imran. Right. I was like, I'm going to be real quiet during this conversation because I don't know what to say here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do we police this? Is this the thing that we even worry about? Should it be that I grow a tougher skin? Because that is the like, as someone who's grown up somewhat defensive of certain things, mm -hmm. that's the immediate reaction for me is, do you just grow a tougher skin and get over it? Like the internet's going to be the internet, whatever. Yeah. And. It, for me, that conversation was very important for informative for my time at Game Informer of understanding that it's not necessary that I change who I am for how other people want to be. If that's just who, how it is, then I will focus on the positive aspects of this community because there's a lot of them. There's so many people who are yeah. willing to be nice and happy. And by granted, that's probably like 99% of the community. Right. And I will focus on that and just not worry about that and that's not the same thing as having a tougher skin that's me improving myself from without from within do you think 
is there any way you can break down that negativity? Was a majority of it coming from the keep politics out of our games group? Do you think a factor of it was your race? How do you break that down? I don't... I think it's all kind of like a gelled together thing. Yeah? Because, like, my race is a lot of why I think what I do. Because I grew up with a different experience. I grew up in the American South being a brown kid coming from Georgia and growing up during 9-11 and having different things said about me and to me and things like that through my life. It's an experience that a lot of people are not going to have. And thank God a lot of people are not going to have that experience. But it gives me a perspective that kind of goes, okay, well, we can't just keep politics out of this stuff because politics does matter. Representation matters. Like, I I made a point, I think I was looking at Game Informer at that point, or maybe not, maybe it was before, that Far Cry 4 really mattered to me because a it was a brown character starring in the game. And to a lot of people, they weren't really thinking about that. I was like, oh, that's a neat novelty. Yeah. But for me, it's like, I grew up with, like, Dalsim as my role model. Because, like, in video games, there's not really that many other options. Yeah. So when you, we start talking about, like, Okay, well, Far Cry Five is taking a political, non-political stance. Far Cry New Dawn is taking a political, non-political stance. So I, I remember trying to interview the narrative uh, director for that game, being like, "Hey, let's talk about this," and she shut the whole conversation down. Like, right. we're not talking about politics or anything like that. I remember being so bummed about that because I wanted to talk about how they're clearly trying to introduce, like, flirt with the idea, and that's when I kind of got pissed at video games for a while because they were flirting with politics as an idea. And it matters so much more to people like me, and it can matter to other people. It's just we never really touch it. So when people start getting into the idea of, like, we want you to stay, keep politics out of video games or anything like that, and they come at me because I put it into news stories or whatever. Right. Honestly, it affects those sort of things. It's like, okay, but I'm the news writer for this sort of thing. If you're looking for to remove the, remove the human aspect from this entirely – then you're not asking for a news writer anymore. You're asking for like an AP report, not even an AP report. You're asking for like a single byline or something. Right, right. And it's, that's what always frustrated me. It's like, I didn't really care if it was about me or about my race or about what I thought or that I had a weird name or my physical features or whatever. If you're like, all of it is in totality, my entire experience. So any one aspect of that that people don't like, it's, all probably gels down to the same thing. Right, right. With the developers thing and like Ubisoft, do you think it just comes down to like the early pitches for a lot of these games were like, we're going to go hard at this. We're going to take a Rainbow Six Patriots style approach, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And then it just gets softened down and filed down over time until eventually by the time it gets out the door, it's just uh, no one can argue with this and ship it. Yeah, pretty much. I, I think you do have to like flatten things out for a mass audience. And we've seen lots of developers have to do that. Like I... It was a line in Life is Strange too, like the very first episode, where someone says there's politics in everything. And I was like, that very pointed line. That they're tr- clearly trying to go like, hey, I know people are going to complain about this thing, right. so let's just say f*** it. Like, we're, right. this is that kind of game, so deal with it. I don't think Ubisoft makes those kinds of games. And like, fine, that's their that's their prerogative. That's exactly the kind, like, there was that insane interview i think beginning of 2019 it was like here's why we don't have politics in games and it was such a strange thing of oh all things have politics so why should we like we can't get away from it so we might as well not emphasize it right it was such a circular logic and it was yeah it's very confusing too going on the college of Duty modern warfare cover story because the internet definitely reacted to i think during the rapid fire and then we had a standalone video too just talking with uh that team talking about how they don't see their game as a political game uh, and I think during the rapid fire is me like, what? Surely you must be joking. Uh, and and may, tell me if I'm naive. I'm sure they were coached and media trained and Activision, yada, yada, yada. But I think those developers were coming from a sincere place of just like politics and calling it a political game. It could mean so many different things. I think they were literally talking about like, do we mention Donald Trump in this game? No, we don't. Therefore, it's not a political game. I think that's genuinely where they're coming from. But maybe I'm I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I remember when you guys came back with that quote, I remember being so shut off because like, I wrote the E3 preview for that and I was there at the reveal and at the reveal event, they're like, we're ripping from the headlines. This is about modern military conflict. This yeah. is like real world things. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, well, I, remember I talked to JV right after I got back. It's like, yeah, they're having a weirdly political story this time. So when they came back with, yeah, this story is not political at all. I was like, what? 
Did things change in the last three months? It's just the definition of the word political. And I felt I felt out of my element. You would have done a much better job. But during like the video interviews where the developers are like, well, what do you mean by political? I even had to stop and be like, I... I barely know. It just seems like something I should ask. I felt like a fraud. I'm like, I could not give you a great exact definition of here's exactly what I mean. But it's like they have Ollie North in some of those games. They have right. like, Going they back, took yeah. a real life war crime and then changed the history of it. Like you can't do that. And then also say your game isn't political. Right. It's, it was such a weird thing. And it's a way that it's a dog whistle in a lot of ways of, Hey, we're, we're not political. We're trying to get people who don't want politics and games to play this, but mm-hmm. maybe they'll learn something. Like, that's what they probably try and tell themselves. Is like, maybe they'll learn something if they come into this game and try and, like, look at this in a political way. And yeah. political doesn't necessarily always mean, like, left-leaning. It can mean something, anything, anything. like any sort of stance, really. Yeah. But it's an easy way to... Cause it's a... There was... Remember Black Ops 3 when there was a Twitter account? that was like they changed it to like real news call of duty or something like that and they posted like fake news of there was a bombing at the site and something like that Jesus. and then they had to be they had to explain like no no this is an alternate history account we're not doing the same like this is not a news report so yeah. i think they want to avoid things like that it's just they it's always been a clumsy excuse a lot of developers use right right well hey, on a much lighter note um where do you get your news from <laughs> where, where do you go these <laughs> days to collect good news from the internet for me, I always had an RSS feed of like, here's what everyone else is reporting these days. But also like, it's it's a matter of you make enough contacts in the industry and usually people will give you a heads up on certain things. So like there were the embargoed things of, hey, we're PR or reaching out to you. This is good. Like, we're going to talk about this game announcement in a couple of days. And like, mm-hmm. okay, cool. I can prep that up for the next couple of days. Sometimes it's straight up like a developer or somebody reaching out to you is like, hey, this is about to happen, or we're about, like, there are talks of layoffs at this company. Yeah. Like, I remember I wrote a story about Six Foot once, the uh, developer of Dreadnought, and mm. I was able to get, or talk to a couple of people on the record, or a couple of people who had wanted to be anonymous, like, what the culture was like at that company in the night, or the couple of weeks before the layoffs, and I ended up breaking it before they did, or before, like, the, it was actually official. Like, so it was, it, things like that of, you get news from the people who are making it, most often but the way the video game industry works it's honestly a lot like the movie industry where sometimes news just go to certain people and like obviously as game informer we know that sometimes we just get news exclusively because that's like that's our business it was we would do cover stories and then people would report on the news that we got because it would be like ign headline says you know infinity ward says call of duty is not political or whatever right and then i'd scrub through and be like should i be angry about this okay this seems like a good a good regurgitation <laughs> of the content, so it's cool. But then, like, uh, I, what was the game? Disintegration was on IGN's yeah. first this week. I saw that, yeah. It's like, so you get news that way because that's the deal Disintegration made with IGN to work with them on getting them this news. Yeah. Well, what about just from the consumer level, though? Like, if you had to recommend, because I'm also in that level now where it's like, if I'm just looking for a good place to collect news from the gaming industry... I guess I'm on Twitter and looking at Warrior 64 and Nebellion and stuff, but do you have like a go-to, like who do you think is doing it the best out there? Uh, those two, I definitely, I follow those accounts. So sure. I, I definitely get news from them. Uh, there's a lot of small reporters that I think do great jobs, like gameindustry.biz. Like they're not a super small site, but they focus on things that a lot of people, other people don't. Yeah. Uh, it's on a consumer level, social media honestly probably is the best place and it's one of those things that as a news writer you start getting like concerned about over time of well i guess our news is coming from here but we're putting a more professional look on it than just a simple tweet right but most people just read the headlines in the first sentence anyway like you dedicate three paragraphs to a thing and most people aren't going to read it unless there's a lot of new information in there and most of the time there's not yeah yeah for sure uh what does your schedule look like these days what what is your life like so with, I'm still working with Kind of Funny, yeah. but they just hired uh, Blessing Adeyeye, who is just like fa- fantastic new personality. Like he's a young kid, but like incredible at what he does. And it's really nice to get that like level of diversity in gaming these days. Yeah. So they, he's taking like the main Kind of Funny games like face right now. Uh, I'm mostly freelancing these days still. So like I've. T- today I was working on an article for Vice that's going to go up sometime this week. Huh. 
by the by the point this goes up, it'll probably already up. And like I still freelance for IGN and other places like that. So my schedule is more or less waking up, checking Twitter, and playing video games. It's not a thing I've gotten a lot of chance to do in the last couple of years. Yeah. And living in San Francisco, you're okay doing freelance? You think that's sustainable for a while? It mostly is. Like I, okay. I'm lucky to have a, an apartment that I do not pay that much rent for compared to a lot of other people. Like it's a, I'm. Well, yeah, it's all pretty blurry. Well I'd imagine the rent's very cheap. <laughs> I mean, I'm managing to live rent free in a lot of people's heads anyway, so it's good <laughs> that I get a. I'm where I am, but it's I. San Francisco is. I don't know. I had to be here for the Game Informer job, so. If nothing else is keeping me here in the next couple of years, maybe I don't be here anymore. But it's that's a larger question than like, you know, whatever. Because video game journalism is not necessarily a thing that's necessary to be in one single office. Like, right. Granted, Game Informer did that, but like I wasn't remote in San Francisco, but that's because they wanted me to, to attend San Francisco events. If I was just doing news or analysis or whatever, I could theoretically be anywhere. So it right. doesn't like it's no game journalism is no longer a San Francisco centric uh, job. Thank God. Where would you want to go? I would. I would really love to live in New York someday. Oh, interesting. Like better, that's not that much better than San Francisco in terms of yeah, like what are you doing? Or, <laughs> you could go anywhere, uh, man. Like there was, there was a time before. I think around this year, I was probably going to ask to come into Minneapolis for like a permanent position there. Mm. And I, I didn't know how that was going to go. It was probably going to be like a d longer discussion than just like, hey, yeah, come on over. Mm -hmm. But like, I I think that's, like I said, what I wanted to do was like, you know, do the analysis and like all the, like also be on video sometimes and things like that. So I was thinking maybe I'd just come to the office and I've had my stint in San Francisco. It's good. Yeah. But I, I don't know, maybe the Midwest, maybe go back south to where I grew up, maybe up to Seattle. It's, I like it here, but it's not necessarily where i want to spend the rest of my life right i think yes i think that's a very good idea <laughs> i mean i've never lived in san francisco but i'm very happy to be in minnesota but uh, who knows like whatever the future holds i could end up being here for like the next 10 years right right yeah. so in the future you don't know exactly what it holds but you want to be doing something with some outlet for a creative voice but then also keeping your head down in news it's a <laughs> when you put it that way it's like i kind of don't know what i want to do okay it's I've been I, I calculated it up the other day of like when did I first start writing about video games versus what I'm like right, right now, and it's I started writing about video games when I was 17, so I've professionally so I've been doing this for 17 years, and I know JV went and he changed to PR. Bert's like kind of changed to like Mark, like there are people who left Game Informer and they made massive career tracks. I'm like I'm so proud of them. Mm -hmm. I wish I could do that, but I don't. I think I would get bored of like going to do something that's not just a different video game every day. Cause like, this I, is what I know. This is what I'm good at. And if I went to like, let's say PR and like PR people have asked me, are you interested in like coming in for these sort of things? I'm like, yes, but also I don't know that that's me right now. I, I feel like I haven't wrung enough out of the dynamic aspect of this job yet. Okay. The dynamic so, aspect. Like in the, yeah, you're never gonna well, get I mean, like it's it's a different thing every day, and that's if let's say I was working on PR for even a series I really loved, like let's say it was the Yakuza series. I were, if I was working PR for that, sure. At some point, I would be like, I want to write about something else. I want to do a big preview about the new Call of Duty or Asgard's Wrath or whatever. I want to yeah. like publish a new thing and go like, that's me. That's what I like contributed to. Those are my words. That's my byline. Yeah. Well, you could always go to the WWE. That would keep a certain amount of variety in your life, I think. I uh, sure. Great. It, it absolutely would. Your I also want to talk WWE games. <laughs> what uh, What do you think you've learned about like one of the most amazing things is listening to your uh, the kind of funny games daily with JV and Serial. Is like oh, like they put a lot of like you had to lift a lot of weights for like the basic messaging of the Patreon and like ads and supporters and sponsors. And that was really fascinating. Has that been like a, but also because I'm trying to get used to that world myself, but what has your experience been like just shifting over into like the salesmanship aspect of helping out with kind of funny? It's been weird. Cause like, it's never been a thing I was used to 
like at all in my career. Yeah. I've always been like, cause like when we first had that talk about the website of like maybe making a new one, the idea of like selling a thing never occurs to me. <laughs> so if I made a website, I would try to make it like the best ga damn game journalism site ever. But if that doesn't matter, if it doesn't get any money coming in. Right. So like when it comes to kind of funny in the Patreon, like reading ads, it's like, oh, well, that's the job for me. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I ever like functionally understood it as the idea of selling content. Because even when we were working at Game Informer, there were, it was, it happened, but it was extremely rare that GameStop's interest would intersect with ours. Sure. And cause a, or change what I would have to do. So when it does become when the the interest of the buying audience, which is essentially a Patreon, they're mm -hmm. paying you for a product, their interest is a product and the advertiser's interest is reading the ads and you have to make all those coalesce around an entertaining thing. It becomes a a thing of like a, an interesting area that I'm completely unused to. Yeah. Of, I don't know how to, I still don't know how to read ads entertainingly because... <laughs> Do I vary? Do I make my own? Like, do I make my own editorializing here? If I do, are they going to be the advertisers going to be pissed that I went off script? Yeah, like it's it's so much stuff that I I'm just not used to worrying about. And when it comes in, I I think I end up relying on being a bit more monotone and dissociated from it because I I worry so much about messing it up do for you, people who aren't me. Basically, do you feel like you would act differently and? Uh put more of your heart and soul into it if you were also i don't know maybe running kind of funny a little bit more like do you understand why greg miller is so good at those ad reads i i think greg miller is a natural natural born entertainer and that's one of those things of like there are times where we're sitting across the desk and I'm like legitimately in awe of <laughs> i cannot believe he's taking he managed to take like this boring ass subject and make a thing that's not clinical. It's it's informative and entertaining. And it's like holy shit. Like I could if I worked with him for ten more years, I don't know that I would be able to get that good at it. Yeah. But like I understand how they're able to do it because for me, I show up, I get a check regardless of how good I do. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> well, it's still I'm sure going... there's a bottom to the barrel at some point, but yeah. Yeah, like people aren't going to like cancel their subscriptions because I was un unentertaining. Sure. But there are going to be people who do like, he has to worry about like, how do I make the best overall product? Mm -hmm. And I think if I were in charge, I would constantly be worrying about that. Yeah. And I would have a hairline that's much further back than it is right now. Okay. And I would constantly have this like, okay, well, are we doing the right thing? I would second guess everything. Uh, thank and you that's for... probably why I, one of the many reasons I did not end up doing a Patreon after the Game Informer stuff. Right, right. Well, thank you for giving me a heart attack. Okay, so you say <laughs> no, you can you're good at it. Oh, thank yeah. you, thank you. Of, of the natural-born entertainers that I know, you are one of the top ones. Oh, fresh. But what have you learned as uh, the mole inside of Kind of Funny? What have you learned from those hosts about some magic sauce? Have you had any, like, real takeaway lessons of, like, oh, I'm going to write this down. This is a good approach to this style of conversation. What I learned is that if you're having fun, then everything else will flow naturally from there. Yes. If you go in there awkward with an agenda of what you're going to do, like obviously that can help with organization and things like that. But if you're there to talk about what you want to talk about and just enjoy yourself, it's going to be an entertaining product. Like kind of some of the most fun I've had during – I'm kind of funny. We're doing like those 12 hour, 24 hour streams where you're just kind of sitting on the couch, making jokes, playing some games, yeah. just doing whatever. And like, I, I loved being on the Game Informer show, but the Game Informer show was also an entirely different beast. You get, you went in, you talked about your topic, you clap out and like, <laughs> that it was the next thing. And like, right. it's, it's a different subject. So I kind of liked when we did the E3 show a little bit better. Because, like, the E3 shows were, here's this big thing that's happening. Let's talk about the entire big thing. Right. And, like, that was always a lot more fun to me. And I think that's when I ended up just loosening up and having more fun doing the conversation. And I ended up enjoying – I think I ended up performing better. Yeah. So once we – once I went into Kind of Funny, like, the first couple of weeks were, like, kind of awkward because I was treating it as a news show. And at the end of the day, it's – it's not a new show. It's people who are friends who are talking about news. That's what people want. Yeah, they want the friendship. They want the community aspect for sure. And it's it's so scary. Like anytime there's a recording and we go a certain amount of time without like voices raising, either in laughter or anger or something, it's just like, 
what are we doing? Like the entire point is just to have fun in front of a mic. And if we're not having fun for five minute stretches of time, like something is going horribly wrong. Like right. the big thing is like every time I'm not in your recording at Game Informer, we're then also a little bit at MinMax. And I want to definitely have more stuff that I'm not in, in, in MinMax in the future. But just like, I just worry so much about like someone's trying to make jokes, right? Like as long as there's some laughter here, we're not doing an entire game club just seriously talking about the Outer Worlds level design. Like someone has, has to crack a joke at some point and make each other laugh. That's all I, I care about. I always think about like the old giant bomb cast stuff of like when Vinny used to just sort of make a, an aside into the microphone that nobody really paid attention to. Right. It cracked me the fuck up. Like those were the kind of things where like th that's what I want to emulate of just enjoying yourself on the microphone is such a difficult thing. Yeah. But it's also makes a much better product in the end. Do you feel like you've evolved a lot in the last couple of months on that level? I think so. Yeah. I like to think that I've gotten over a lot of my nervousness that I don't have to worry about, am I, do I sound like an idiot in front of the mic? Because as I know what I'm talking about, I'm pretty sure. As long as I'm not getting ahead of myself, I think I should be fine. All I have to worry about is, am I presenting the argument I want to present? And I, am I presenting it in a way that I think is funny? Or am I, am I enjoying or whatever? Because it's not always about being funny. Sometimes it's just about being informative. But there's... A middle ground and there's a way to weave the two together to hit both your goals yeah yeah for sure well, that's a good lesson i think for sure um hey here's a weird one was it weird with the layoffs and sorry to keep uh harping on the past and stuff oh, please go ahead okay uh was it weird to be the center of a news story not like it was a, a megaton throughout the industry but you know like other sites would write it up and stuff was that weird after covering news for so long to be like oh i'm, I'm kind of an important at least one seventh uh component of this <laughs> saga in the game industry now so there was a weird thing where around the time of the layoffs i think about a couple of days before my dad was in the hospital for like uh, kidney troubles and i like i was keeping talk with my mom like you know let me know what's going on all that stuff and the layoffs happened so i that day i didn't call my mom but the next day i did because my at that point my dad was already home and he was like just getting bed rest mm -hmm. so i was like hey i have something to tell you like this happened and she's like yeah, I already heard your father saw it, like read it online. I was like, oh, that's weird. Oh, that's like, super that's a weird. weird thing for my father to find out I was laid off before I could tell him. But it was strange to see like all this stuff. Like I remember watching a fun house video about GameStop yep. and Game Informer and all that stuff and thinking like they're talking about this, this group of people that I watch regularly is talking about me. Mm -hmm. And it's very strange because I've never met them. I've never talked to them. We have a we have our own parasocial relationship, but it's it's strange that at least in this moment they know my name and they're talking about my name. I like my girlfriend has her own has a gaming podcast too, and I was listening to her talk about it, and she didn't use my name because she's like she didn't want it to be like talk about the relationship or anything like that at the time. And like for like it was a strange thing of like oh they're talking about me and kind of in a way that's dissociated because they're not me. So is this the way I talk about other people? And is this the way other people feel when like they see their names in my news stories? hundred percent. And I bet like they got some facts wrong or you'd read something. that's like, well, that's not exactly how it went down along the way. That's what I would ha find a lot and just have that weird moment of like, wait, is this like every news story, but everybody else then is just like little details along the way are kind of misconstrued or seen from a weird perspective. Right. Yeah. It's like, I remember seeing the initial stories, like, we had, we had the thing at about, I think it was about nine, 10 a.m. my time, because it was right when I clocked on that I got the call, and mm -hmm. like, hey, this is happening. And then about by about 11, I think the story was out there based on the tweets that I, Kyle, Surreal, and I had been making. People yeah. figured it out. So I just went ahead and said, like, went ahead and said hey, this has happened. And then by about noon, because I had been checking Twitter the entire day, and like it didn't stop at noon, and certainly didn't stop by five. Mm -hmm. But it was all the news stories started coming out, and they're saying certain things of like, oh well, it was everyone on the associate level, which is like it's true, but not entirely true. Right. Or certain things like, oh well, it was almost all of Game Former staff except for like the senior people. It's like also true, but not entirely. Like, yeah. It's the, so I was like, do I correct this or do I just let news do what it does? And I, I left it because, like, I had enough problems that day. I didn't to worry about whether the people were getting right or wrong. Right. But it it became one of those things of I always worried when I had typographical, factual, whatever errors in my stories. And being a part of it, knowing that I could correct it, 
and then just being like, no, I've got enough problems today. Right. Made me realize, oh, well, why didn't anyone call me out before about these things? Like, oh, because this I am one story of a million and they have other issues to worry about right then. Right. And also it's a good reminder that, you know, every story or headline you see is just the tip of an emotional, complicated social iceberg, you know? Right. That's that's the weird thing, too. It's like, oh, I feel like there's so much more to say about that era of Game Informer, stuff like that. But it's like, ah, you don't want to, like, it, there may be someday there'll be an outlet for it. But, like, you don't want to burn bridges and, like, you want to support everybody as much as you can and stuff like that. So it's like this nice thing of, like, okay, past is in the past. Time to move on, right? Yeah. There was a time where I was, like, really pissed about it. Like, of course. Just generally, like, at GameStop, at pretty much every, like, everyone. And mm -hmm. a lot of that was just, like, that was the way my depression was kind of flaring up about that specific thing, mm -hmm. but then things sort of just calmed down. And I, I saw a writer a couple of weeks ago at star Wars cause he was in town for the premiere and it would just, we get to sit down and just have a nice conversation and just be like, Hey, yeah, I'm working on this these days. Like if you're talking to these people, like I put you down as a reference for these things. Like it was that sort of conversation of like, okay, yeah, I, I remember why I like this guy in the first place. Right. I was never really mad at him. I was never mad at like, Okay, there were people I were mad at and still am kind of mad at. Yeah. But there like I was never mad at any of the people I worked with. And that whole it was an emotional roller coaster and probably for the it's only for the best that it was not a the stories were not necessarily about me. Because mm -hmm. if it did become about me, then I'd probably have things to say that I would regret later on. Yeah. I think I think that's very well put, for sure. Uh does it uh does it bum me out having to check Twitter so much for your job? <laughs> How are you? How are you dealing with that? Uh, I've thought about this a lot, uh -huh. and like, it it was a major part or part of Game Informer is that you pretty much always had to be on Twitter, like for my job specifically, because mm -hmm. that was where news broke. That's where you got reactions to things. I would post a news story, and then I'd be checking the responses, which not always great sure. to the news story because they would read the tweet, and that's how they they would react to it. Twitter, I feel like, is an incredibly toxic place, but at the same time, like. I know personally I'm a little not addicted to it, but I get enough out of it in both good and bad ways that I'm just always going to be there. And that's mm -hmm. maybe that's just the way I grew up on social media that like it's the replacement for live journal for whatever over the years since I've been a teenager of like this is how I get my news from a friend circle that I don't always see every day. But there's also just a, like I've gotten some real shit because I have open DMs. So there are people who are happy to tell me what they do not like about me. Right. And like from my personality to my gaming taste to my physical appearance to like, huh. and it's like, okay, well, I don't know what you got out of this, but honestly, it was fun to block you. So I'm fine with it. Sure. <laughs> but, but learning to hate, I mean, you're giving into the emperor, dude. Like getting a yeah. thrill out of blocking, you're already part of the problem there. I've always kind of wondered why, like, what those people do really get, what do they think is the long, like, what what benefit are they getting out of sending? Because, like, Kind of Funny has a thing that's, like, they send, people send in corrections during live shows. Yeah. So, like, they'll tell us what's wrong. And I've seen people not use that to not only, like, harass me, but they've harassed co-hosts. They've, well, like, I've looked over there, like, yeah, this is bullshit. I'm like going through the show and like deleting this and stuff like that. Yeah. And at one point I was actually like, Hey, stop doing this. Like, this is stop. This is not right. You're being a, you're being a bad person. And it's one of those For things. You? Of, how do you convince someone to be empathetic? And it's, right. I don't know how you do that really. I don't think you do it on the internet is a uh, lesson. Number one, <laughs> I, don't <laughs> think there's a, I don't think there's a strong takeaway other than I don't. Yeah. There's no, there's no easy solution for that. Yeah. The, uh, so, okay, do you ever detach from Twitter? No. That's I so should. effed up. Uh, <laughs> I, like, there, I mean, like, I, I communicate with my girlfriend over, like, Twitter DMs because it's, like, easier that way. Oh, my God. I... No. <laughs> it's, it's, simp it's simple in a lot of ways, but, like, I, I like – I it sounds attention hungry, but I like just being able to blurt out my thoughts and just put them somewhere right. and then seeing reactions to them. I like being able to be a part of that discourse mm -hmm. and just like say, because honestly that Twitter got me in trouble a lot during Game Informer. <laughs> but, 
Like there were parts of there were times where I would mouth off about something mm-hmm. and publishers would get mad. Uh, individual people would get mad. People would contact Andy about a mm-hmm. thing I said. And Andy would be like, hey, this person's threatening to sue. And they'd be like, cool. I could delete it if you want to. He's like, nah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if I could. T- I, I can't tell the story at this point. There was a time where we saw a video of a th- an announcement early. Okay. And I had prepped a story about it. I oh, yeah. tweeted a- <laughs> I don't want to get into too many details. I remember about this it. now. Okay, yeah. But I tweeted about it and I didn't tweet about the announcement, but something tangentially related to that series. So okay, so I can okay. This is a vague thing. I don't want to go specifics. But yeah, we got early access to this video, and then you were talking about an established character in that video. And but it's like, well, why would you yes. be bringing up that established character now? And um, the actual reason was I was watching AGDQ when they were in it. But, like, the company got very, very pissed, and they contacted Reiner. I was like, you broke NDA. Right. You can't be talking about this. It's like, so I had to, like, oh, no. I had to, There were parts of my – every employee review I had was, you need to be a bit more cautious with Twitter. And I never was because uh-huh. that was just – it was my own – you're a rebel, baby. <laughs> that was my vice. And, like, honestly, sometimes companies just get pissed that I was talking tr- trash about a game mm-hmm. or – I remember specifically there was a time where Square Enix got mad that I was like, oh, Dragon Ball Fighter Z is so much better than Dissidia. I don't know why they're coming out at the same time. Mm-hmm. And like Square Enix was mad that I tweeted that. It's like, well, it's true. Like, But, like, and I don't want to take the side of some lousy corporation, mm-hmm. but what's what's the point of putting that out there? Like, are you really getting <laughs> I, that much out there on Twitter for tweeting that stuff out? It's easy just to like, I don't need to have an opinion on this. It's fine. As I go further into my life and get older, it's like, yeah, I start to realize, like, I don't need necessarily need to tweet about this. There it is, okay. Especially, like, I, I've always been fairly politically active on Twitter, but, like, there's a time, there's a point now where, like, primary fights are happening. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to get into a situation where I say, like, well, I support this person over this other person. And then get into a million tweets uh, tw- or Twitter fights and have my friends talk about to me about, like, because they support someone else. And, like, oh, well, you're obviously wrong and stuff like that. And that's... Maybe that's a larger lesson I should learn about Twitter in general versus just the one subject. It's just it's easy just to take a step back. Like I remember it was Gersman, I think, on the Bombcast a while ago, and it's not it's not a genius statement. I remember at some point he's like, you know, I just realized like I don't need to have an opinion on Batman versus Superman. And it's a kind of like, it's a very simple statement, but it's like, oh yeah, that's right. Like <laughs> we can just not weigh in on things on the internet and no one's going to be like, hey, wait, what does Imran Khan think about Batman versus Superman? Like n- very few people on planet Earth, no offense, Imran, would care about <laughs> such things. It's just like, just let it all go. You know, or even like, it's weird with um with MinMax content. This is slightly related, but you know, I was thinking about like stuff we could prep for the holiday break and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, I kind of want to do a video on Pokemon Sword and Shield because it captured a lot of clips. Mm-hmm. And I just realized like, all the clips and all the things I want to post out there are just like negative because it would just be like, oh, it could be a jokey video about like ranking all of the interiors in Pokemon Sword and Shield, like especially some the of the bigger towns interiors. where they're 100% identical, except for like a character is in a different spot every time. <laughs> or just like, you know, that ending I think is absurd. The legendary dogs sound like a uh, dog S. But I just realized like, what, what am I going to do? Spend several hours of my day just to put more negativity towards game freak out in the world like it's fine like not that saying i actually oh go ahead i i appreciated the fact that like i i was on review for death stranding so i was playing it like this that month before the game came out yeah and it was actually kind of freeing in a way See? to just be able to like play it and not just like oh, i'm gonna tweet this dumb thing like this dumb video clip granted i did that afterwards okay like i tweeted well, a couple of those okay. but like it was a nice to just be able to like i'm just playing this game and yeah. i'm gonna not worry about like my social media take for this thing i'm not gonna interrupt this cutscene. and like, i think if you did that a little bit more i'm not trying to silence your twitter account i think you'd be happier <laughs> i think unplugging from that even though i meanwhile i'm just face buried in discord all day <laughs> but like <laughs> unplugging just from that hot take you just don't need it i you're probably right and that's probably maybe that's the thing that i should be looking forward to and looking to in 2020 but it's also one of those things of like in in this job in this like modern th- like society does it are you even able to unplug from twitter and still be reasonably connected on the things that you're supposed to be connected on and for me, a lot of it's 
Probably because like I could read RSS feeds all day, but I'm not going to know what the discourse about a certain thing is. Right. Or you're going to miss so God, much snark. The, yeah, <laughs> you're gonna, remember the Randy Pickford thing from right. Right. last year? Like there are so many things that happen on there that I feel like I would love to unplug for a couple of weeks. I don't think I could do that for on a like I was watching your the Dan record interview that oh, you, guys, sure. you guys did, which is fantastic by the oh, way. Oh, thank you. But like when he said like, oh, I don't look at Twitter, I don't listen to podcasts, don't listen to anything like like that. I'm like, oh, that sounds wonderful. I could never do that. Like not just capability. It's just like that's not the way that I absorb things at this point. Yeah. Do you have just tweet deck open all day? Is that the idea? Yes, it's open right oh. now. Honestly. Oh, that's horrifying. Oh, <laughs> I, I mean that said, I've. I mean, I took Twitter off my phone years ago, but I've definitely, especially with MinMax now, it's like gotten much more plugged in. And I just realized like the worst days that I have, especially working from home or like on the weekends, are the days where it's just Twitter, Patreon, Twitter, Patreon, refresh Patreon, check out Twitter. Because the, the Patreon is just a godsend, but there's something so diabolical because there's little notifications and you can see who's unsubscribing or choosing to support. And like, Basically, you know, I don't know if you're this type of guy, but you know when you get really paranoid about people like unfollowing you on Twitter and stuff? Imagine yes. that, but then that's combined with your annual income. You know, so it's just like seeing this number fluctuate constantly like this, like I can just spend entire days refreshing and looking at that and it's not they are the worst days. I just need to sit back and be like, "You know what? Numbers are going to move up and down. I'm going to try my best here and hopefully move ahead." Yeah, that was like when this whole thing happened, I was talking to some of the people, like you included, about like, okay, what the the idea of a Patreon video game website? Mm -hmm. Like, what does that look like? And I ended up coming to the conclusion, like, okay, well, all of you guys have video talent personalities. Like, there are Facebook groups dedicated to you know sharing your clips. I wrote news stories, so for me, the idea of jumping into a Patreon seemed illogical because it's such a personality driven thing. And at the time, my personality was limited to what I wrote down. Uh -huh. So, like, and my Twitter account, basically. But you're on the Game Informer show. Like, people know your voice plenty. I I would be shocked if... I Okay, I, I don't think I had the same degree of mind share that you guys have. Sure. I think by being remote and stuff, it was always an extra step to, right. to rope you in, yeah. Which was always, like, fine. That was not necessarily what I was completely looking for i was very happy with my job yeah but like when that the idea when you don't work for gamestop and not know the ha the actual come down eventually mm -hmm. like i think all of us kind of expected it at some point it just caught us all off guard at that particular time sure but i had thought about patreon and like who would i want to work with in patreon what like what would that look like and the idea for me was always I don't know that I could run or I could be part of a personality based thing because I don't know that I'm I'm at that level of like a like Dan Riker talked about that, too. Like if he could do a Patreon, he would. I'm not at that level because he's had so many hundreds of hours of video content at this, this mm -hmm. point. And well, you're saying that, but you're you're a co-host at Kind of Funny. <laughs> OK, now <laughs> maybe I theoretically could. Okay. But like at that time and like. It's that idea of if you've been you've been an expert at, or you're an expert if you work at something for ten thousand hours. Right. But the corollary of that is you're also specialized, and that's mm -hmm. kind of what you're good at. And you're not good at are not good at much. You're not specialized in anything else. You're not an expert in anything else. So I did news writing and games writing for ten thousand hours, but I didn't do much else of where the industry is actually moving of podcasting and video right. content and things like that. So. Where that people, people don't subscribe to hear get your essays on video games, they subscribe to get your video content, which is mm -hmm. why I like I do think Minmax is a fantastic idea and like where it made most sense for you guys to do that. But for me personally, it was I don't know where I go because there's it used to be there were 500 jobs and five million people who wanted them. Now there's like 200 jobs and yeah. 50 million people who want them and it's so hard to figure out well i have the experience do i just am i able to slide in anywhere right do i want this job or is this like a lower rank than what i was doing before is that like less am i going down by doing yourself this, or yeah that's the terrifying just, part yeah yeah it is scary and then you start to think about yeah just like how do i constantly you know like every once in a while there would be an offer for me to like leave game informer or like i'd be interviewing for something outside of game informer 
Uh, and it is just that terrifying thing of like, well, wait a minute. If I had that job right now and then the opening at Game Informer happened, it's like, oh, you could be a video, video producer and travel the world and basically have complete creative freedom on games and covering games. Like, yeah, I would absolutely leave that job that I would leave Game Informer for. So then at that point, it's like, okay, I guess I will just stay put and stay at Game Informer for nine years. And I'm, I'm happy I did for sure. Yeah. Uh, what uh, what advice would you have for MinMax? Uh, you don't need to be an expert in all of our content, but do you see things, uh, you're a very smart guy, and think, oh, they're blowing it here. Why aren't they doing this? I think you, when we first started, you had that thing of, we don't just want to copy what game, what we used to do at Game Informer. Yeah. We want to do like a larger, like different kinds of things. Right. And I think it's a good idea, but I think you don't ever want to be in danger of running from yourself. Cause like what you did establish at game informer is still you and your personality. And yeah. like the, those ideas are always going to still be yours. So I, if the fan base wants more game informer stuff with a different name, I don't necessarily uh, think that's a bad thing. I hear, I hate it. <laughs> I know you hate it. I'm, I get I, it. I'm in the exact same place. And like, I, like I, it's one of those things I can give advice for, but not actually do myself. Right. And like, I totally get it when people are like, Oh, we want you guys to stream like old games. I'm like, yeah, I'd be happy to. Like I got a couple in mind that are sitting on a shelf up there and stuff. <laughs> but at the same point, it's like, I just, I don't know. I want to make sure that I'm not trying to bill it as like, Every week we're playing a crappy old game and you know it's like I don't want yeah. to step on any toes of replay. You know, and maybe with stuff like the game club and stuff I feel better about cuz like oh I feel like that was like well actually I mean Tim and Miller were also really important to that and Reiner to some degree. But but anyways with something like replay it's like I didn't start that. I came in, you know, a couple months after it started and yeah. stuff like that. So, but yeah, that's good advice. That's helpful and it's yeah, I think just looking at like our YouTube channel or output every once in a while, it's like, oh, I think I was expecting it to be more wildly different at this point. And so maybe we are being more conservative than I expected. Like, you know, there's been a couple pitches and stuff that I've tried to get rolling that haven't quite panned out. And so I appreciate the advice, but I think I'm going to take the exact opposite route <laughs> for at least I part mean, of the content. Thing, you, can't, you can't ever pre please the entire audience, which is a thing I've also discovered. Of like, There's always going to be people who wish you did it a completely different way than how you did it. And even if you if you follow their advice, then the other half of the people are going to be like, well, why did this change? Why didn't you do it like the other way, which yeah. is what I preferred? It's right. like when you're managing a Patreon, an audience-driven thing is such a difficult balanced maneuver because like again that was one of the things that game informer that was great is we never had to worry about well is this going to play it's like well yeah. let's just try it and see if it works and that was i think one of the best things when when leo came on yeah. like that he always just had those ideas of like who cares if it's not a series let's just do this one idea for sure but <laughs> <laughs> i totally agree on every front but i think the problem that maybe we got into back in the day game informer and even at min max i worry about teasing the community by planting too many little seeds you're just giving everybody one more reason to be like why aren't you doing more of this so it's just a matter of like if we can just make it clear that this is a one-off or make it clear that this is like a limited series i feel like that's a lot healthier than just shotgun blast of sprouts and then let the community be angry that their sprout isn't growing you know what i mean so right. it's a it's a tough balance and it's it's all i think about all day actually <laughs> it's like it's those things of like we used to have those morning game informer meetings and once a week, maybe more than once a week, somebody would have an idea and it, it would just kind of fall by the wayside because there wasn't any time or whatever. Because yeah. between cover stories and just the natural flow of video game stuff, it just you can't always pull people out of their schedules for something like that. It's usually video, yeah. And yeah. then I had to be a stickler but and be like, no. I, re I remember simply like it was before E3 2019 or maybe it was 2018. Surreal just piped up one day. It's like, so I want to talk to a fortune teller about E3 predictions. Yeah. And we're thinking like, that's the most brilliant idea ever. And like, I wish we got through more stuff like that. Just everyone having like, I just want to have a really dumb idea. I just want to do this thing. Right. The and problem is so that every other, said than done. every other dumb idea was not as good as Surreal saying, let's have a fortune teller predict E3, which is just like, well, <laughs> we're all busy. I'm busy, but like, I will kill myself to make sure that happens. <laughs> And I'm very yes, glad let's that let's make time for this thing. Yeah, exactly. And we didn't do a follow up uh, in 2019, but I guess hey, Min Max, maybe we could just we could actually bring the fortune teller on and make it a regular segment. Is just he reads our fortune here yeah. at the Min Max Studio. The next year is that you hire a fortune teller to constantly be on every podcast. 
<laughs> that would be so stupid. <laughs> hey, you never know. That's the fun. That's the grand adventure of this thing is I've got a million notes on my phone of directions to go. And so, you know, there's a whole I mean, as a patriot, I'm quite excited. Oh, good. That's so sweet. That's so sweet. Um, anything you'd like to plug, sir, other than your hot Twitter account with just a thousand hot takes a day? I mean, you can find my 1,000 hot takes on Twitter, but you can also find the links there that I usually, uh, whenever I something goes up, like when I freelance for an article, you'll see the links there. Uh, obviously, you can find me on Kind of Funny. i trying to think of what else I do besides that. Uh, those are the main things. I have a Twitch streaming channel that I haven't touched in a couple of months, but oh. I'm planning to start up again soon. That's twitch.tv slash I-M-R-A-N-Z-O-M-G. There it is. I think my YouTube is the same. But also, you can probably also find that on my Twitter. So, yeah, check there, and that'll have all the links you need. Sweet. All right, thank you for your time, sir. And uh, I, I know you have a busy schedule, but you're welcome to Skype in or travel out to Minnesota, for that for that matter. But you're welcome to Skype in whenever I've you'd like to make next stuff. Maybe when it's not super cold. Okay. So, like, right. that one month of the year. Okay. Yeah, yeah, honestly, if you swing by in the summer, that'd be super fun. But, yeah, obviously, <laughs> for game clubs or anything, if you ever want to be more involved with MinMags, just let me know. Will do. All right, sweet. All right, thanks so much for watching and listening, everybody. See you next time. From in-depth game club discussions with the community to live streams every single week, weekly podcasts, exclusive videos, everything under the sun is at patreon.com slash minmax2ns. Check it out, everybody.